Hello, everyone. And today we're in chapter 14 of Nathan Clarkson's book, Good Man, and it is entitled Servant Hearted. The measure of a man's greatness is not the number of servants he has, but the number of people he serves. John Haggy. I was troubled when I was 17. I was a headstrong and proud young man. I had a desire in my heart to do good, to follow God and to live a great story, but it was buried somewhere inside of me, overshadowed by my adolescent antics. I ran into a little group of guys with too much testosterone and free time and not developed enough brains to make wise decisions. Interestingly enough, I met these guys at church. I sat next to Matt, Ben, and Chad at youth group one night, and Matt leaned over and asked if I wanted a starburst. I did. The rest was history. We had good hearts, but with youth comes pride. On Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, we would be raising our hands and jumping to the latest worship song. Then, on Friday nights, we'd be racing cars while blaring rock music, kissing girls, swearing, and smoking cherry cigars. We had a desire in our hearts to be good men and set ourselves apart from the world in a positive way, but the pull of youthful stupidity was strong, and in a tug-of-war between responsibility and youthful arrogance, the latter often won. However, even with our noisy teenage attitudes, we all decided to join a church small group, maybe as a dare to ourselves or maybe as an unconscious response to that voice in our hearts. We ended up in an accountability group that met on Sunday nights at the house of a college student named Stefan. About ten of us would sit around and talk about God and the sins we were struggling with. Though when my turn came, I offered more boasts and brags than confessions. Still, Stefan kept inviting us back, opening his home to a bunch of rowdy high school boys because he wanted us to know God and become better men, even if it meant putting up with our shenanigans. It's hard to imagine the frustration he may have felt at taking the time and effort to try and reach a bunch of cocky teenage boys with uninformed opinions about the world, but he still did it. Maybe he had a feeling it was worthwhile, that it would ultimately make a difference, even if he couldn't see it yet. We attended the small group for a couple of years, and often I wonder if it looked as though we were making no progress at all. But there, in the actions of serving us, listening to our teenage anxiety, and being a present and willing example of a good man, Stefan was making a difference in our lives despite the arrogance I proudly wore on my cut-off sleeves. I spent many memorable times in that small group. Times of catharsis, laughter, and even occasional learning. But out of those two years, one night in particular stands out. It began like most of our evenings together, loud laughter, talk about girls, and overall goofing around. But as the meeting began, Stefan pulled out a large bowl of water and some clean, dry cloths. We looked at one another, intrigued. He asked us to sit down in some chairs he had set up in the middle of the room and take off our shoes. Then he proceeded to work his way down the line, washing each of our feet. Our leader, the one who had years of wisdom and spiritual authority on us, knelt down and washed and dried our stinky teenage toes. To some, this might sound like some sort of weird ritual, and I get it. It comes from the beautiful story found in the Bible where Jesus, on the eve of his death, washed his disciples' feet. In those days, it was something only a lowly servant would do going near the dirty and sweat-stained feet of working men. But before Jesus died for his friends, he served them. He knelt as an example of what real love is and what good men ought to do. The story is detailed in John 13, 3-5. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. As I look back on that night when Stephen knelt and washed our feet, it's a picture to me of what a true and good man does. It's a picture of what the best man, Jesus, did for his disciples and is willing to do for all of us. Living in both L.A. and New York City, I've had to face the cultural values of both cities. There's a lot of pride, ego, and material status. I've been confronted by people showing off who they are and what they have. I drive an old beat-up Honda I've had since I was 16, and I remember driving it down the streets of Hollywood next to the brand-new, shiny sports cars. 
I felt out of place and underdressed in my white t-shirt and goodwill jacket, walking next to teenagers covered in name-brand clothes. I've experienced the sting of disappointment when comparing my humble career to those who are younger, richer, and more successful than I am. I've been on sets with stars who refuse to talk to or look at extras. And I've heard the phrase, do you know who I am, more than I'd like to admit. I'm not immune. I catch myself trying to show and tell people how great I am, highlighting my best moments, hiding my worst, bragging and exaggerating about the things to feel more important and make others feel less than me. I don't like it about myself, and I don't like it about these towns, but deep within every one of us is a seed of pride that wants to believe we're better than others. When we feel the sneaking insecurity that we're not, we so often overcompensate, hoping to soothe our fragile egos. But at the end of the day, when I finally sit down in my dimly lit studio away from the noise of the streets and the shining lights of the city and open the book about the Jewish carpenter I try to follow, I am confronted with a staggeringly different life philosophy. It stands in stark contrast to the image of the modern man I am surrounded by, the one I am so often tempted to become. In Jesus, I find a picture of the creator of the universe, the maker of the stars and time, stepping down into our broken world, being born in a manger, living a life of loving and serving others, making food for the hungry, touching the sick, healing the broken, and ultimately dying for people who turned their backs on him. It's a picture of things he has done and things he continues to do. For me, even when I turn my back on him, the one who had every right to brag about who he was, show off what he could do, and demand service from others humbled himself to love and give everything he had to those of us, me and you, who could do nothing to deserve it. So how do we reconcile culture's version of a modern man with a humble and meek carpenter who chose to put others ahead of himself? Do we dog ourselves and self-flagellate to remind us of how bad we are? I don't think so. I don't think that works. I've tried the false humility, but it's just that, false. I found that when I practiced it too much, I quickly drifted into self-loathing, which isn't something Jesus wants, practiced, or ever asked for. It might be a shortcut to looking humble, but being truly humble isn't thinking bad things about yourself. It's thinking beautiful things about others. Jesus knew he was God, but he didn't pretend he was less than he was or use a false humility to downgrade himself. Instead, fully knowing who he was, what he had, and what he could do, he thought deeply of others and how to love them more. It's easy to say things, but it's hard to do them. Looking humble is one thing, but being humble and actually putting it into practice takes effort. But for those of us on a journey to becoming good men, it's a worthwhile effort. I remember how hard my parents worked from the time I was very young. In addition to writing 15 books and speaking around the world, my mom worked tirelessly to love and care for our family. She cooked meals, cleaned messes, caught tears, and home-educated all of us. In addition to being a pastor, my dad worked long hours at the office to keep the family ministry going and ensure we were provided for. At the end of each day, I recall how my dad would notice how tired my mom was, so after dinner, he would gather all the dishes and clean the kitchen. It was a small gesture, but it was meaningful. It gave her time to rest. He was thinking of her needs above his own. And he did this over and over and over again, giving young me a picture of what being a servant really is. He loved and followed the way and example of Jesus by modeling humility and servanthood. In every example of servanthood I can think of, whether it involves my small group leader, my dad, or Jesus, one person who chose intentionally to see the needs, wants, and desires of someone else, one person decided to look past their own comfort and desires, to give of their time, their effort, and themselves. Jesus provided the ultimate example of this when he gave everything for us. And he asks us to do the same for the people around us. Whether it's washing dishes or washing feet, we each must think outside ourselves and focus on serving others if we are to combat our natural inclination toward pride and take hold of the life-changing value of servanthood. Being a strong man, an effective man, a good man, requires humility, and humility requires action. Most of us have trouble doing this. We are too caught up in the whirlwind of our own lives. 
But to be good men, we must humble ourselves and see others and their needs, even when it requires us to make a sacrifice. We don't do this because it's fun or easy, or because we fear judgment if we don't or expect praise if we do. We do this because the maker of heaven and earth, the maker of men himself, does it for us. In Matthew 20, 26 through 28, Jesus tells us this, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. New International Version. If our God and Creator does this for us, to be truly good men, we are called to do the same. We need not pretend we are worse than we are or conjure a false humility that helps no one. We need only to lay down our own pride so as to love others in the same way our God has loved us. This will look different for each of us. For some, it might look like serving our family after a long day or listening to a friend over a coffee or volunteering on our day off. But whatever way we choose to serve and humble ourselves before others, we do it because God does it for us. Questions for Reflection Number one, are humility and service important? Why or why not? Number two, what are ways you can start thinking less of yourself and more of others? Number three, what are your own obstacles to humility and serving others? For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Galatians 5.13 a prayer for the servant-hearted. God, who shows us how to love, give, and serve by loving, giving, and serving, teach us to follow Jesus' example in thinking beyond ourselves and serving the hurting and needing world around us each day. Give us a desire to love the fractured places in the world and the hearts you have put in our proximity. Break our hearts for what breaks yours and give us eyes to see where we can act as your healing hands and feet to others. You tell us that honor is reserved for the servant of all. Help us live humbly enough to desire higher praise than the world offers by giving of ourselves, our time, and our resources to those in need. Give us eyes to see like you and give us heart to serve like you serve us. Amen. So that is the end of the chapter. You know, um, especially in my adult life, I have served. Um, I did start out in high school by being in a church youth group, and um, I did some serving there as well as we used to visit um, an elderly, elderly widow um, who was lived all alone. And we would go there and play games with her and do puzzles with her on the weekend. And that was a major thing for a high schooler to give up a few hours on the weekend. And then when I was um, in college, um, I served by being in the campus ministry with doing the clowning and miming, which took a lot of time with getting scripts together, rehearsing, and then actually physically going to places like schools or youth group retreats or even um, nursing homes. And then as an adult, I served by helping out at school and church and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and do many things for my children. And now I am trying to also serve you, who are my listeners, and try to show you how to be a good man. And this, and this book helps me, too, to be a good woman. I think this book can really help either to help them to become a better Christian, but it is definitely you guys, Katori's fans, that brought me to do this. And I am happy to serve you by helping you become better men. I hope you all have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. God bless.